Hello and welcome. I am Ardwolf and this is the first in a series of videos intended for newcomers to wargaming or for those interested in this subject. In this series we'll cover some common wargaming concepts and talk about how to approach learning a wargame working with a single specific game. We'll talk about a different part of the rules each episode and by the end you should be familiar enough with the game to play. For the first series I have chosen to go with GMT's Paths of Glory. I have chosen this title for a couple of reasons. Um, for one, it's a highly regarded, award-winning title. It is also easy to get a copy and is likely to remain so, unlike some other titles that are um, intended as introductory war games but are out of print and or you have to print them off yourself. Uh, you don't have to deal with this. It should be very easy to find a copy of Pans of Glory. Secondly, the game employs a number of ideas and concepts that are common to many war games, so it will be a useful tool to introduce those concepts to you, the viewer. And third, uh, Pass of Glory is not a terribly complicated war game, but it's also not a terribly simple war game either. And this may seem counterintuitive for an introductory series, but I want to demonstrate that most war games are really very manageable to learn once you get the hang of the concepts and the way war games are typically laid out and organized. I think you'll find that by the end of the video series, uh, that uh, despite a complicated looking 32 page rule book, that a moderately complex game like Pads of Glory is actually very manageable. And in this first episode, I'm going to talk about the game itself, its components, the rule book, uh, and then in subsequent episodes, we'll talk about uh, specific individual rule sections that make Pads of Glory work. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Paths of Glory is a game about the First World War designed by Ted Rasier and first published in 1999 by GMT Games. It is now in its fifth edition and has won numerous awards, including the Charles S. Roberts Award, which is Wargaming's highest honor. On Board Game Geek, it is currently the number two rated war game. So here we have the components of Paths of Glory laid out. Now, like most war games, it contains a map, a rule book, um, some player aid cards, and a set of cardboard counters or chits, which represent military units or are used to mark various things on the map. Now, Paths of Glory's uh, map is mounted. Um, that is not always true. Many more games have paper maps, and we'll talk about how to deal with that in the next series, uh, dealing with the next game. Um, Paths of Glory is also a card-driven game, which means that play proceeds from cards that are played by the opposing factions. Um, so the game also includes two 55-card decks, one for the Central Powers and one for the Allies. So yes, uh, Paths of Glory is a two-player game. However, there is a three- or four-player variant available on Board Game Geek for those who are interested in that kind of thing. So uh, let's take a closer look at the map board. Paths of Glory's map covers Europe from France in the west to Russia in the east, and there's also this special inset map for the Near East. Now, special rules apply to the Near East map, and we'll cover those in a later episode, um, but the map consists of various types of spaces that are depicted either as squares, as circles, or as eight-pointed stars, and these spaces are connected by lines. The lines, the, the, the points themselves, represent uh, locations that your military units can occupy, and the lines represent the valid paths between them that you can move along or attack across. Wargamers would call this style of map a point-to-point -point map. The square spaces represent regular locations like Urfa here. Those square spaces, and for that matter the star spaces, uh, that are bordered in red represent victory point locations and those are worth points to, uh, toward determining who the winner of the game is going to be. The eight pointed stars represent fortresses. The difference between these and the regular square spaces is that fortresses have an inherent defense and just can't be marched into, uh, while these circular locations represent beaches that the allies can use to invade later on in the game, and they are considered locations on their own. Now you'll notice that each space has a top half and a bottom half. What the top half indicates is, by its color, it tells you what faction that that space is controlled by at the start of the game. The allied powers are this sort of light yellow, while the central powers are this uh, sort of medium gray. The bottom half of each space tells you what terrain is present in that space. Now the terrain has an effect on combat, it has an effect on movement depending on what type of uh, terrain it is. In Paths of Glory, those effects, those terrain effects as we call them, are relatively minimal, but we're still going to cover them uh, as they come up. 
Paths of Glory uses two kinds of playing pieces die cut from cardboard. We call these counters, but they're also sometimes called chits. Now, most war games use counters, but some also use wooden blocks or plastic miniatures, but the, uh, the central ideas are the same. Now, the first uh, set that we're going to take a look at are called markers, and these are used to track various uh, rules or point totals or game features on the map. So, for example, here we have the victory point total, which keeps track, uh, counter, which keeps track of the current victory point score, which determines who is winning the game. We have some move and attack markers to indicate those activities. Um, we have some entrenchment markers because, after all, this is World War I, and we have some control markers to mark either Allied or Central Powers control of a particular space. And we have a set of event markers. Now, this isn't all of the markers that are included with Paths of Glory, uh, but we'll get into the functions of each of these as, uh, as the videos proceed. Next, we'll take a look at the various military units. As you'd expect, each country's units are a different color. So we have blue for the French, gray for the Germans, gold for the, or whatever this color is for the Turks, a sort of a, a yellow for the Italians, and a brown for the Russians, and a green for the USA. And uh, these are from a different game. I'll get to those in a moment. Um, even though there's only two players, there's, uh, there are many nations that fought in World War I, and each one's represented here. So each of these factions will be played uh, by a given player. So the Allied player, for example, is going to control the French, the Russians, the Italians, and the U.S., uh, while the, uh, the Central Powers player will play the Germans, the Turks, and the Austro-Hungarians, which aren't here. Now, there are some restrictions on how units of different nationalities can move and fight together, but we'll get to those later. In Paths of Glory, there are also two different sizes of unit. These larger units represent armies, which are large numbers of men also backed by artillery, air support, logistical support, and so on, where the smaller counters represent corps, and these are just bodies of men. Corps fight less effectively. They use a different combat table in this game than the armies do, reflecting the corps' lack of those other assets like tanks and poison gas and air support and that sort of thing. Each unit counter has a number of pieces of information on it. So, for example, here we see this is the German 4th Army. That is the name of the unit across the top. The symbol in the center represents what kind of unit the uh, piece represents, and this is the symbol for infantry. Now, most war games use a set of symbols that are relatively standard across war games. Not all games use them, but a lot do, that are based on the standard NATO symbols. So, I've, I've provided a couple of counters from another game. These are the symbols for armor, cavalry, and artillery. These are ones that you'll see relatively frequently in war games. However, for uh, Paths of Glory, the game is at a scale such that um, these types of assets are not represented by distinct counters. They are part of the armies. So an army will include artillery support and maybe a cavalry brigade, and when tanks arrive, it'll include some tanks as well. On the core size counters, you'll also notice that there are three X's above the counter symbol. That represents that these are core size units. This is another convention that is taken from the standard NATO symbology. However, Paths of Glory only really uses it here, so don't sweat this at all right now. Just recognize that the smaller counters represent cores. The bigger counters that say army represent armies. Also on each counter, regardless of the size of the unit, there are three numbers across the bottom that provide the unit's statistics. And the first number is the unit's combat factor. This represents the unit's strength in attack and defense. The second number is called the loss factor. And we'll get to the details of how this works later, but basically it represents the unit's ability to absorb losses. And the third number is the unit's movement factor. Now, many war games um, have different types of terrain that cost different numbers of movement points to enter. In Paths of Glory, all spaces cost one movement point to enter, again, because of the scale of the game. So this number, in this case, for this game, just means the number of, sp of spaces on the map that the unit can move in a single activation. And finally, most units have a reduced strength side, and this is another common convention in wargaming. When a unit takes losses in combat, it is flipped to this reduced side, and you'll notice that the combat factor is lower, although the other two numbers remain the same. Um, the reverse side is also designated by this lighter colored strip on the back of the counter. So if a unit takes damage, it's flipped over to its reverse side. Uh, if that unit is an army and it takes another hit, then it is reduced again to a core size unit. Uh, whereas if it is a flipped core, we can flip this over. 
If it is a reduced core and it takes a hit, it is just eliminated and goes into the eliminated units box. And we'll get to how all that works in a later episode. As we mentioned earlier, Paths of Glory comes with two decks of cards, one deck uh, for each player. And these are, are three cards from the Central Powers deck. The two decks are different. Um, a lot of the meat of the game and the details of simulating World War One, as Paths of Glory does, comes out of these cards rather than necessarily the rules themselves. So let's take a closer look at these. At the very top of each card, there is a colored bar that contains three pieces of information. Above the colored bar, in very tiny print, is a card number that has no game effect and is not important at all. It's just for reference. The rules will reference cards by number from time to time. Uh, the important information starts in the colored bar. And first of all, where it says mobilization here, that tells us the war commitment level that is needed to have this card in the deck. As the war continues and each faction escalates it to a greater and greater degree, these limited war and then total war cards will be shuffled into the decks. And those can happen at different times for the two factions. So up in the upper left-hand corner of the card, there are two numbers, and the larger number to the left indicates the ops value of the card. One way to play these cards is for their ops value. When you do so, you get a number of ops points, which you can then spend to activate units for movement or attack. The smaller number to the right represents the strategic re redeployment number of the card, if you play it for that. This means that you can move this number of units a long distance, but within friendly territory. So below the colored bar, we have a picture that is somewhat indicative of the event. The name of the card, uh, this asterisk, and the parenthesized number two do mean something. Uh, in red is some text here regarding special conditions for playing this card. You have the description of the card. We'll get to all this uh, later on. Uh, and at the very bottom, you have the replacement points box. This is another way that you can play this card for replacement points. And when you play this this way, these are the replacement points that you get. So the Central Powers, playing Guns of August for replacements, which would be a weird move, but we'll talk about that later, uh, get one for Austria-Hungary, two for Germany, and one for Turkey. Paths of Glory also comes with some player aid cards. Now, some games come with many player aid cards. Paths of Glory comes with only a few. Uh, the first one is this Exceptions and Special Rules rules thing. This represents, which is a nice touch really, uh, all the exceptions and special rules that apply at various times uh, to various nationalities, the special rules that are applicable to the Near East. And this back of this is blank. You get one of these with the game. You also have the player aid car card proper, which contains uh, the two um, combat tables, the core and fire army fire tables. It contains an abbreviated sequence of play. Uh, it contains the terrain effects chart. This will tell you what terrain effects chart is something very common to war games. It will tell you how each type of terrain in the game behaves. This is a very high level strategic game, so there are not a ton of different terrain types, and those terrain types' effects tend to be relatively mild, except for trenches, which are hugely significant. But they, they do have important effects, uh, but maybe not as dramatic as they might in some other games. And then on the back, we also have the peace terms tables. My understanding is that this is a rule that doesn't get uh, used much, um, so we will ignore that for now. I'm not 100% sure we're even going to cover it. On the back, we have a victory point table. These are all of the things that you get victory points for, aside from just taking uh, victory point spaces on the map. Um, this is the schedule of costs that you can spend your replacement points on, and there are a number of special rules that are applicable in all or part of 1914 that are uh, conveniently listed here. So you get two of these with the game. I only got one here at the moment, um, but these will be constantly referred to as you play. And lastly, we have the Paths of Glory rulebook. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the rules in detail in the coming videos. However, for now, let's just say that it is a 32-page black-and-white rulebook. However, only about 20 pages of this are actual rules. The rest are designer's notes, uh, scenario setup instructions, uh, several pages of an extended example of play, so on and so forth. But on the front, we have a table of contents. And I, in particular, would like to call your attention to section 6 here, which is the sequence of play. Now, you'll recall that that was also present on the player aid card, okay? And it's very important because the sequence of play is that part of the rules that all of the rest of the rules pretty much hang on. Um, and that is 
universally true among war games, but not necessarily to the same degree. So if you really understand the sequence of play pretty well, you will understand the details of how all these activities work, um, and that's basically the entire game. So we're going to start in the next episode examining Paths of Glory's sequence of play, and we're going to take it from there. So stick with me, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.